So let's get started. So let's get started. In the last uh, phase of the course, I'm trying to survey as many different ideas as possible um, without really going into the detail of the implementation issues, just the concepts, so that at least when you're using uh, built, pre-built software, you know what these concepts are. So <coughs> this week, I'm going to focus on finite difference method. Last lecture next week, two lectures, I'm going to start working on uh, method of weighted residuals, but both for ordinary and partial differential equations. And then the last two lectures, uh, according to LSU time schedule, we will spend on introduction to finite element methods, again for both uh, uh, ODEs and PDEs. Uh, obviously, these are not going to be in depth. The whole course can be given just on finite element method or, or on CFD. We are not even touching about CFD. There are some special issues that we need to worry about. But finite difference is easier to grasp and extend from ordinary differential equation to partial differential equation, except we needed this new uh, classification, uh, which is important. So in the last lecture, we looked at the motivation for this classification into parabolic, elliptic, or hyperbolic, which is derived from uh, conic sections or quadratic uh, surfaces. So we take that idea and apply to uh, partial differential equations. And we saw that the discriminant v squared minus 4ac that appears in the quadratic equation, the sign of it, the simple way of understanding is is going to determine whether it is elliptic, parabolic, or hyperbolic. So parabolic is a degenerate case when the discriminant is exactly equal to zero. And if the discriminant is negative, when you're taking the square root of that, you get an imaginary number, right? So you don't have uh, what we call real characteristic lines. So those problems tend to be elliptic. But if it is greater than zero, then you have actually the method of characteristics is built on that. It is the partial differential equations have real characteristics that you can uh, construct, and then you can integrate along those characteristics. But um, a, a slightly deeper level of understanding that is, uh, it's actually the eigenvalue of the corresponding matrix that you can construct in terms of these coefficients that appear in here, A, B, C. And it's a symmetric uh, uh, coefficient matrix, and the eigenvalues of those or related to the discriminant, and they determine the nature of whether it is parabolic, elliptic, or hyperbolic. Okay, so we can do a coordinate transformation to take it from its Cartesian frame to its uh, natural coordinates in terms of uh, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3. And these are the eigenvector directions, if you like. And lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 are the eigenvalues of that uh, matrix. And the classification then is if one of the eigenvalues is zero, it's a degenerate case. Once again, we have a parabolic system. And uh, if all of them have the same sign, then it is elliptic. And if any one has an opposite sign, then it is hyperbolic. That's a strictly mathematical way of doing it. And this approach is elaborated much more for systems of equations from two dimensions to three dimensions, etc in the book by Lapidus and Pinder on numerical methods for partial differential equations. It is in the list of bibliography that I have given if you want to dig deeper into that. But from a physical point of view, we need to understand also what is the re characteristic response of these three distinct systems, parabolic, elliptic, and hyperbolic. As I said in the last class, the elliptic systems typically tend to be equilibrium systems. There's no time, there's no evolution of the state variable, in this case u, so typically, it is a bounded system, but it could be infinitely bounded as well. But the boundary values determine what the internal values are. And those are the elliptic uh, partial differential equations. Hyperbolic and parabolic tend to be evolving in character. Typically, there is a time, but sometimes you can have a space taking the same role. But essentially, a first derivative in space, for example. So this is a, a parabolic diffusion equation. And we use that as the template to develop a whole series of finite difference methods in the last lecture. And today, I'm going to continue to develop a few more and then talk briefly, there is time, of how we would extend, extend these ideas to two dimensions. 
and maybe into systems of two equations or three equations that are coupled. Okay, so the discretization process, just like in ordinary differential equations, is to replace the continuous variable u of xt at discrete points xi and tn. Okay, so I have um, my domain that is discretized, let's say, between 0 and 1 with discrete points. And these points are labeled as subscript i. And then I have time that is going on in the other axis. So I discretize those. Okay, so I'm la labeling them as n. Okay, so the superscript n indicates that it is with respect to time, and the subscript i indicates that it is with respect to space. So all I do is I have a finite difference approximation for any derivative of any order. So I look up that table and I say I have many choices. There is no unique way of doing this discretization. So if I take the first derivative of time and replace it by its forward time difference and take the second derivative and replace it by central difference, I get what we call the FTCS method. But the reference point here is I n. Okay? So the template for this algorithm in terms of what neighboring points are related in that particular equation will look something like this. If I have points like that this point, this point, this point, and this point. And the level n plus 1 is the unknown. Everything else at level n is known. So it's an explicit method. And the truncation error is of order delta x square and delta t. Things that we need to discuss today are, is this a consistent approximation to the differential equation? What do we mean by consistency? Is it a stable approximation? What does that mean? If the original differential equation has a solution that is bounded in time, as you are integrating in time, if the original solution is bounded, does this also, this approximation also produce a bounded response? Then we will call that system as stable. Uh, consistency, the following, uh, the idea is very simple. As I take delta t and delta x to 0, both of them to 0, does this difference equation go to that differential equation. Solution of the difference equation approximation approach that of the differential equation. We do that in your project, for example. I asked you to do that in terms of grid sensitivity test or a grid independent test. To do that at least for two or three different grid sizes and see whether they are converging. Okay. So this particular one uh, is consistent because, and we will show that there is a formal way of showing that it is consistent. So the question is like this. You, you all know about Jeopardy, right? In Jeopardy, what is the game? They give you an answer, and you, act, you have to identify for what question that is the answer, right? So if somebody gives you a difference equation like this and asks the question, for what differential equation is that a good approximation? Okay, and that is the question of consistency. Okay, so you, you, then what you need to do is you need to develop the corresponding differential equation from the difference equation. Okay, and ask the question: As I refine delta t and delta x, all the truncation errors do they go to zero, and I recover my original differential equation, or do I recover a completely different differential equation? So it looks like I'm solving this. In my mind, I'm thinking I'm solving the diffusion equation, but I might actually be solving a different type of equation. Or another way of stating that is that the solution from this may actually be a better solution to a different differential equation. Then you have an inconsistent approximation. Okay, so we need to um, uh, explore that concept of uh, how do we test that. Okay? <coughs> and it is explicit, as we saw. And is it stable? So we need to understand how do I determine the stability of uh, such difference equations. And we saw in the ordinary differential equation case uh, a simple model equation dy dt equals lambda y. And we developed a relationship between, if you recall, um, this is, I'm talking about this equation dy dt equals f of y, for example. So determine, to determine the stability, first we do the discretization, 
the discretization tells you that y n plus 1 and the next time step is some function of y n, y n minus 1, y n minus 2, etc. if it is a multi-step method. And we take this differential equation dy dt equals lambda y and rewrite this as y n plus 1 for the model problem. So this is the general algorithm. For the model problem, we take this and write it as some factor times y n. And if that factor g is less than 1, then we have a, a stable system. Right? That's the basic idea. And we need to do a very similar thing for partial differential equations. And that method is called the von Neumann method of stability analysis. And we will see what the idea of that is. Okay. So this is still a review from the last lecture. We developed the backward time uh, central difference for space. Okay. Uh, central difference for space and backward difference in time. And the template for that, after you discretize it, becomes something like this. Okay, so this is at level n plus 1. This is at level n in time. In space, it is i, i minus 1, i plus 1. These are the points that this particular formula is relating to. And it has the truncation error in a gain of order delta x squared delta t. And uh, it is an implicit method. Why? Because I cannot solve for any one of them by using only known terms on the right hand side. Because i minus 1 depends on i and i plus 1. Okay, so you see that this is an unknown, this is an unknown, that's an unknown, and so is this. So when you separate the unknowns and the knowns in this particular equation, you'll get a system of algebraic equations at every time step. Okay, so on the left hand side, you will get a tridiagonal structure. Okay, so at every time step, you will have a vector that you need to invert by inverting the matrix T. Okay, and the vector x contains all the u values along that line. Okay, so this is xn, but there is a vector called xn plus 1. That will be at level n plus 1. Okay, so t times xn plus 1 is equal to bn. And bn will carry the information from the boundaries on both sides. For traditional boundary condition, those are fairly constant values, easy to determine. Do you guys understand what is happening, or am I just going... Okay, you're okay. Any questions? Okay. Crank Nicholson method. That was a combination of both backward and forward method. And it's a very simple idea, but it results in a very very good end result. That is the truncation error goes up. So essentially the same idea once again, we are discretizing it, but let me ask you to take a look at it and see what you find in this formula. What has he done? What what did he think of? Uh, those guys, Hank and Nicholson. If you have to classify it as forward or backward in time or central in space, how would you classify it as? This is the equation they just wrote it down as an approximation to the diffusion mm -hmm. equation. I gave you some sort of hint. It is, oh, the, their argument or their idea was I'm going to take the second derivative term at two levels, at n and n plus 1, and take the average of it. Okay? So if you're thinking of this computational domain, okay, so this is at level n, this is at level n plus 1, and you have these grid points in i. Okay. So in the forward time uh, central difference, we took this as a reference point. So we had these three points and the point above in forward time central space. Okay, Because it is forward in time and central in space. In the backward time central space, we took this, this as a reference point. So we chose to approximate the spatial derivative at level n plus 1. And so it looked like a backward difference in time. Okay. The Crank-Nicholson method says, I'm going to take 
I'm not going to call it forward or backward. The left hand side remains the same as before. In both the forward and backward time, the formula remained the same, just our perspective changed because we took this as the reference point for forward, we took that as the reference point for backward. Okay? The term itself is the same. And on the right hand side, we have a different term, which is the central difference evaluated at level n and the central difference evaluated at level n plus 1 and the average of these two. Okay? That's why you get the 2 here. Okay? It's a derivative at level n plus 1 derivative at level n divided by 2, the average of the spatial derivatives. This, is, this started happening. This is why we needed to do consistency and stability check, because this is a purely ad hoc development. Okay? So people try something, and go to the program, write it out. And this was done in 1947. So they don't really don't have a computer to go and program it. They probably did the calculations by hand with a calculator, right? And look at the properties, and then of course, the mathematicians come in and look at the consistency, the stability, etc. So, <coughs> it looks like if you take this two to the other side and write it as uh, this divided by two, for example, then where it looks like our reference point is right in the middle, where there is really no point. There is no grid. <coughs> <laughs> but if I had taken a reference point there and approximated it, and to approximate the spatial derivative, I say, because I don't have a point here, I'm going to take it the average or of both sides. And then for time, it looks like I'm using points equally spaced on both sides with delta t over 2. So the same formula looks like it's a central difference approximation for time. But it in involves only two levels. Okay, So that's the main attractive part of this and it is a stable method and it is an accurate method also. You can then show that the truncation error, this is an ad hoc proposition and then you try to match it with the Taylor series and see what the truncation error is and it turns out that it is of order that that is squared. So you gain tremendously in terms of accuracy, you are no longer restricted for small slip size. And of course you have to take that equation and reformulate it separating the knowns and the unknowns. So the unknowns remain on the left side at level n plus 1. So at every line, there will be a whole set of equations that you need to solve simultaneously. So once again, you need to invert a tridiagonal matrix. On the right hand side, all the information from three grid points below, i plus 1, i, and i minus 1 at level n appear. Okay, They feed into the forcing term. You should be able to do these kinds of manipulations. Okay, This is from the thought. Somebody dreamt that I'm going to do this, take the average of these two different locations, and then just arranging it and then programming it. From this stage, you should be able to take it to MATLAB and program it. Okay, so any questions on crankiness? And it's one of the powerful methods uh, for in the finite difference world for uh, solving these kinds of problems. Okay. You should be able to apply the same thing for a convective diffusion equation. What is a convective diffusion equation? How does it look like? For example, if I have du dt plus u du dx equals alpha d squared u dx squared. That's a partial differential equation. It's a nonlinear equation, but it's still parabolic in terms of marching. It behaves like a parabolic equation. So the only thing that you need to do is approximate this first derivative also using the same ideas, whether it is forward, backward, or kind of like that. Okay. So you will take, for example, this the, as the average at two different locations for the first derivative, and then develop this method. Okay. It would be nice if we had assignments in each one of them, then only you really learn. But uh, we decided not to go that route. So I hope you will spend some time trying to play with this, uh, if you really want to understand it. Uh, great detail. Then Richardson method, this was done in 1910. I also put historically for the time reference. That's a three level method. So what he proposed was I'm going to use central difference for time and central difference for space. Why? Because I will get higher truncation error, that at least t square error. Okay. But it turns out that it doesn't work unconditionally unstable. It's unstable. No conditions attached. So 
always unstable. Meaning, no matter what delta t and delta x you choose, even if you choose extremely small values of delta t and delta x, that will not that will go up. Okay. Whereas the forward time uh, central space is conditionally stable. Meaning, as long as your delta t and delta x satisfy a certain criterion, that will produce a stable response like the original differential equation. Whereas the backward time central space difference, the implicit method is unconditionally stable. There's no restriction on delta t and delta x. Accuracy wise, you need to pick low value of delta x and delta t to gain accuracy. But stability does not put a bound on delta x and delta t. You would have any and get a bounded response, an inaccurate response if you have a large delta t and delta x. Okay, so that was a proposal way back, and that, so it was kind of abandoned, and then crack nicholson simple trick. Okay, what is the difference between this and the crack nicholson method? They both try to develop a central a central difference or a second order accurate in delta t. Okay, but crack nicholson just used the two levels. This one is also has a problem because you have n minus one, n, and n plus one. You need to have data at three different levels for this. N minus 1, n, and n plus 1. So if you write, if you need to write the stencil for this, you will have n plus 1, and then uh, n minus 1, and then at n, something like this. Okay, that, that, some, these used to be called computational molecules. But when in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of these activity in the area. Similarly, in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot of activities in bifurcation. Those were all developed in that uh, time frame. <coughs> so in many books, you'll find just a template like this with the coefficients that go in each one of them identified in the circle. Okay, That gives you the formula. Now, Buford Frankel method is a fix to see how to make this work. We know that it doesn't work. How can I make it work? It's unconditionally unstable. And their idea is to replace this Again, it's an ad hoc proposition. Okay, so to replace this by the average at the n plus one and the n minus one level. So to replace this value at the center u i n with the val average at the top and the bottom. Okay, so then that the same formula then becomes becomes. Okay, so the only difference is this term has been replaced by the average. And the two will cancel out because you have the average there. Okay. And you can then rearrange this equation into this form. But it is a three level method. You need the answers at n minus 1 and n to be able to you predict what the n plus 1 is. But it is an explicit method. Okay. So what is the problem with the three level method? You have only one initial condition. So for parabolic partial differential equation, at time equal to 0, this is your x and time axis. At time equal to 0, you have the value for all the spatial positions. But you cannot use this because when time equal to 0, it will require minus 1. Time equal to minus 1, you don't have it. So you need to use the forward time central space method to develop one row. And then you can switch to this. So this is the same problem that we faced with ordinary differential equation with multi-step methods. So you, you take the same approaches in the multi-step methods when you have a starter method? You have a starter method, exactly. A single step starter method, and then you can go on for this. But these are not really very popular. These days, finite difference method is not very popular because they require you to have simple geometries, discretization, and uniform mesh. For non-uniform mesh, you can handle it as we saw in uh, the ODEs by using coordinate transformation, by clustering the points through a trans uh, grid uh, transformation mapping. But for nonlinear geometries, it, it really still becomes a difficult. So unstructured meshes, they're all much more naturally fitting in the finite element formulation. So uh, we will see a little bit of that uh, later on. Now, how about hyperbolic wave equation? Instead of the diffusion equation that we have seen so far, if your starting point is this equation, it's a first order equation, okay, but it is a wave equation, and alpha is your wave speed. Okay, 
So the method that's quite popular for that one is so-called the lax Wendroff method. The idea here that they went about developing is interesting. We just don't pick up reference approximations from the table. We will eventually have to do that. But what he did is do a Taylor series expansion in time. So uin plus 1 is equal to uin plus the derivative of u, the first derivative of u with respect to t, evaluated at n. These are all evaluated at n, plus 1 half the second derivative of delta t, evaluated to then delta t squared, etc. Okay? And from the partial differential equation, you develop. Now, when I put u subscript t, that means it's a partial derivative with respect to time. Similarly, ux means it's a partial derivative with respect to position. Okay? So ut is minus alpha ux. That is, I'm taking this equation and writing it as ut plus alpha ux equal to 0. And then I'm solving for ut by taking it to the other side. That's what I've done here. And then I take the second derivative of this equation okay, with respect to time. So utt is equal to minus alpha utx okay, plus mixed partial derivative d square u dt dx. Okay, so these come from the differential equation. But why do I do that? Because I need I need to put what u of t is, what u of t t is. Okay, so I get that information from the uh, differential equation itself. And of course here, uh, what do you think I'm doing? When I'm going from u t x as equal to minus alpha u x x. So I'm writing this as ut operated on x. Okay. That is a another way of writing this would be d d x of d u d t. Okay. Now I substitute for d u d t one more time, and that's what gives me minus alpha. Where is it? Minus alpha u x, and so it becomes the second derivative with respect to x. That is alpha squared u x x. You can continue this, but uh, in the lax wendroff method, they, s they stopped at delta t squared term. And so take all these results and plug it back into this. So uin plus 1 is equal to uin, which is this term, plus substitute for ut. Okay, ut is minus alpha ux. So the these terms are exactly the same, plus 1 half of utt, which is alpha squared uxx, delta t squared. Now use the central difference for all the spatial derivatives. Okay, so it becomes uh, this term is the same as this with the truncation error of delta x squared because it's a central difference, and this term for the second derivative is this. So this is a slightly different approach, and it tells you that there is developing finite difference approximations is limited only by your imagination. You can develop in any different way, but you need to make sure that once you arrive at the final form of the equation, you put it through some tests to make sure that you are really solving the problem that you want to solve. Okay? So after you drop the truncation error terms, this would be your final template for the lax wendroff method, where C is alpha times delta t over delta x. Alpha is your wave speed that appears in the equation, okay? And that is a very important number. It's called the current number or the convection number. And stability of these schemes are de determined by the current number. Some algorithms, you need to have that as less than um, 1, for example, okay? So this goes on. The excellent book on uh, this kind of thing is one by Hoffman, numerical Calibration window. I'm not going to fight this. I was just thinking that this is working very well today. But you didn't even say it out loud. So if you want to learn more about these concepts, this is a very good book easily accessible by Hoffman. It's also in the list of bibliography that you have.
And I've taken all these definitions of the concepts from that book directly, word for word. Okay. So a finite difference equation is consistent with the partial differential equation. So we are looking at the concept of what do we mean by consistency as a topic of earlier. So FDE, the finite difference equation, and the partial differential equation are said to be consistent if, as you continuously refine delta x and delta t to go to zero, the solution of the finite difference equation approaches the solution of the partial differential equation. It's a nice concept to state. Okay. Can you really verify independently for every problem? The answer is no. If you have, if you're lucky enough to have a linear partial differential equation for which you know the analytical solution, then you can test them off. But for nonlinear solution, we don't even know what the true solution should be. Okay? But the hope is that you will see the convergence of the results. Okay? That uh, uh, if you're calculating a macroscopic quantity like a drag coefficient or flow past a sphere, as you refine the grid, the drag, drag coefficient will reach a constant value, even in the higher Reynolds number range, where it is highly nonlinear. I'm not talking just about the Stokes regime. Stokes regime, we know that analytical result. We can validate against that. But in the high uh, Reynolds number regime. So let me ask you um, a question that is kind of related to this convergence idea. But we are, here we are talking about convergence of the difference equation solution to the differential equation. But there is also problems where we have uh, a limit point, okay? So suppose that you, you take the Bradu problem. The solution is like this. But Bradu problem is a nonlinear problem, particularly when uh, epsilon uh, mu is not equal to zero. You don't have an analytical solution, okay? For mu equal to zero, you have an analytical solution. So this limit point can keep moving with changing mu values, right? And I'm going to get the solution for a certain discretization, 20 grid points. This I think is this you did in your uh, second assignment, but you did check only this part. I asked you to look at only grid refinement of the solution itself. Now I'm asking you to think about what would happen to the limit point as I refine the grid. Will they change? Because once you discretize the differential equation, you get a set of algebraic equations. And you're finding the limit point of the algebraic equation, right? So the algebraic equation has the delta x as a parameter in there. So it's an extra parameter. So you fix delta x, you get one curve, and you get one limit point, OK? And you change your delta x, the shape of the curve will look the same, but the limit point, in fact, in fact the whole solution will change slightly. Okay, so the limit point will also change. And so when we're talking about convergence there, we need to make sure that as delta x goes to zero, the limit point that you calculate goes to the limit point of the differential equation, which we have no way of knowing what it is. <laughs> so the only way that we can get at is through this extrapolation method. Okay? And that's why I asked you to plot, if you remember, the solution versus delta x. So you can extrapolate that as delta x goes to zero. If you generate it for three different delta x, and then extrapolate it to delta x equal to zero. So it's a whole class of methods that have been developed based on extrapolation ideas. So you get the solution on three different grid, and then try to do an develop an algorithm instead of doing a curve fitting uh, that will allow you to predict what the solution in the limit of delta x delta t going to zero is. But we don't have the time to go into the extrapolation methods. Uh, but they have not been very popular. In terms of, if you look at what kind of ideas have taken hold in uh, commercially available packages, um, grid refinement is one, adaptive grid is another one, where dynamically you change the grid in regions where there are sharp gradients. But uh, <coughs> this idea of extrapolation is not really uh, taken hold. Uh, the other one idea is, the first one is consistency. The second one is, what is the order of a finite difference approximation? Okay. Because in some cases, we do ad hoc development, like we did for uh, dufort Frank. Frank. Okay. In this method, we just said, OK, the, that term gives a trouble for me. So I'm going to replace it with, see, this term was giving trouble for me. So I'm replacing that with the average of 
this and this other exactly don't have to exist. Supposed to be the same term. That's an ad hoc heuristic way of doing it. If we do that, what is the truncation error? Does the truncation error remain the same as it was before? We need to find that out. Okay, and that's that's what the order is. So the order of a finite difference approximation uh, is when you plot this solution against delta x. Okay, so what you will find is delta x over some norm of the solution. Okay, so the solution may be like this okay so the slope of that okay is considered as the order so if you're making ad hoc assumptions about constructing the finite difference your order may not even be an integer number it cannot be one or two maybe 1.5 whatever it is okay. so that you can find once again only numerically for nonlinear problems for linear problems you can do this idea of uh, consistency check that will also give you some idea of what the truncation error is I will show you the consistency check later on. Okay. And the next concept is stability. We already talked about it. Okay. What do we mean uh, when we say that a particular algorithm is stable? So if the original differential equation has a bounded response, my finite difference approximation should also have a bounded response. Then that numerical method is stable. Okay. The idea of stability is a subtle one, particularly when you're doing simulations, when things blow up, you don't know whether it is due to numerical instability or due to the physical instability of the original differential equation. So again, grid independent testing will answer that question partially for you. If you refine the grid and it becomes stable, then you know that it's a numerical artifact. Then you can go after uh, getting the stable solutions. And the last concept is con convergence. So if the numerical approximation approaches the solution of the differential equation as delta x and delta t or delta y goes to 0, then you have a convergent method. So you have a convergent method, you have a stable method, you have a consistent method. These are all the tests that we need to do. <coughs> so the approach, one of the approaches is called a modified, I mean Hoffman calls it as the modified differential equation. And what is the idea? So you don't worry about what differential equation gave you a certain difference equation. Forget about it. So this is where I gave the analogy to jeopardy type of a question. Okay. So here is a template for a finite difference approximation. And answer the question for what differential equation is this the best approximation? Okay. And how do we do that? In this particular one, D is a constant. It is a constant that includes alpha from the model itself and delta t and delta x from the numerical approximation. Okay. So you do a Taylor series expansion. You, you have to assume, okay, the re reference point is going to be i n. The reference grid point is going to be i n. And you can, from, from inspection, you can say that this has the template like this. Okay, because you have n plus 1 and then you have n on the right hand side. And this is i minus 1, i, and i plus 1. This is n plus 1. Okay, so this is my template. Okay, so if I take i n as the reference point, then it is a forward time centered space. So I expand everything around the reference point. So i n remains as i n, but i n plus 1 on the left hand side, when you do a Taylor series expansion, you're going to get ui at n plus the derivative of u. Remember, this is in a Taylor series expansion in time domain because it is between n and n plus 1. Okay. So it's going to be the derivative of u with respect to t at i n, the reference point, multiplied by delta t, plus 1 half the second derivative of u with respect to t, delta t squared over 2, plus the third derivative, delta t cube over 3 factorial, which is 6, etc. Okay. We, we are assuming that we don't know where the differential equation came from. We want to go back to the differential equation. So every one of these terms is treated as a perturbation from the reference point i n. So we are doing a Taylor series expansion. So the next one is a Taylor series expansion in what? In space. space, in the x direction. So I put both plus and minus 1. 
because it can handle then both these terms, i plus one and i minus one. And what you'll notice is that all the odd terms have sign change, and the even term just has the plus sign. Again, the odd term has plus or minus. So if it is u minus one, u i minus one, you will have u i minus the first derivative with respect to x multiplied by delta x plus one over two, the second derivative, minus one over six, the third derivative, etc. Do you have any questions on this? All we are doing is doing a Taylor series expansion for each one of the term that is away from the reference point and take this and put it back. Okay, so we are going to replace wherever we have i minus one, i plus one, we are going to replace from these two equations. So a little bit of algebraic manipulation there. Okay, so on the left hand side, I had u i n plus one, which was replaced. So the left hand side is replaced by this entire term. Okay, and that's what this one is. On the right hand side, I already have u i n, that stays as it is. And then I have a term u i minus, uh, u i plus one, this term. Okay, and u i plus one is from the Taylor series. Because it is a plus, everything remains a plus there. Okay? And then the dot 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 indicates it's a Taylor series expansion. Minus two ui, which is in the original formula. I don't need an expansion because it's a reference point, plus ui n minus one. And n minus one will have alternating signs. Okay? So that is ui n minus the first derivative plus the second derivative minus the third derivative, etc. And then you will notice that the same color coded ones will cancel out because they have the opposite sign. Okay? So this cancels out, that cancels out, and these two will add up. It will give you one half plus one half, which is one. Okay? And you will find that u n This un and that un that you have, and then you will have two un here, and then you'll have one there, and one there. So all the uns will cancel out. All the discrete points at the same reference point, they all cancel out. Okay? And so the terms that remain on the left hand side then is the derivative, the first derivative. <coughs> of u of t multiplied by delta t, which is this term, uh, plus one half u the second <coughs> derivative, delta t squared, the third derivative, delta t cubed, etc., is equal to on the right hand side, I had d, so I'm replacing d by alpha delta t over delta x squared, because that's how I defined it. So this d has been replaced by that. <coughs> and then the terms inside cancel out. After I cancel all the terms out, what is remaining is the second derivative u x x delta x squared, but that appears twice, as I said. So you, you, you get rid of the one half, okay? And higher order terms, okay? Now what you will find is that the delta t can be canceled from every one of those terms. Here you have delta x squared, that delta x squared cancels with delta x squared, and you have a delta t, okay? And that delta t will cancel with this delta t. And what you will get is then simply ut equals alpha, because the delta x squared has been canceled and the delta t has been canceled, so alpha times u x x minus all the higher order terms, okay? This is the process of getting the so-called modified differential equation. From the differential equation, doing a Taylor series expansion, um, you come to this stage, okay? And at this stage, then you ask the question, okay, as I take delta t to zero and delta x to zero, do all these terms go to zero? What is left? If what is left gives me the original differential equation, then that is the differential equation I'm solving. Okay? So you can start with any differential equation that is given to you and answer the question, the best differential equation that that difference equation will solve is obtained uh, through this process. Now, when I first learned as a graduate student, I said, 
going forward and are going backward, why should it be any different? Why should I find that this is this template is actually solving um, a completely different differential equation? And of course, the answer is simple. The answer is, if you start systematically from a differential equation using finite difference approximation tables, and you get a different difference equation, and then you traverse the path, you should get back to the same point. But we make ad hoc changes. Okay, when we make ad hoc changes, we lose that information. We don't know which original differential equation. So we did that, for example, in the dufour Frankel method. Uh, so we just said, I'm going to take the average. Even in uh, uh, Crank Nicholson, we said we're going to take the average, right? So when you do that, I think it is important to go through this process and answer the questions. And the book by Hoffman has, for all these methods, a modified differential equation. It goes through the development of each one of them. So I just picked a few of them without going through the intermediate details. If you take, for example, the lax vendroff approximation and ask the question, what is the modified differential equation? So you see on the first line, this is just a summary, original partial differential equation from which we started developing the finite difference approximation. Okay, the lax vendroff we went through some uh, kind of unique uh, Taylor series expansion to get this. This is not, for example, simply written as central difference in time and central difference in space. Okay, it's much more than that. And the question is, if you give me this as the template, the finite difference equation at the E, what is the corresponding modified differential equation? So you do a Taylor series expansion of this term, this term, this term, this term, and this term, using I n as the reference, but everything else uh, expanded around that. And you will get your modified differential equation as this. And as delta t goes to 0, and delta x goes to 0, the right hand side does indeed go to 0. So this is a consistent approximation for that differential equation. That's what the idea is. It's, it's an approximation consistent. And that tells you. But here is an example where it is not consistent, the dufour frankel method. So the difference template is this, and it's a three-level method. Okay, it requires n minus 1, n, and n plus 1. And if you develop the modified differential equation, you get the, this is for the diffusion equation. You get those terms. But you also get a term that is delta t square, and then alpha ut t times delta t square over delta x square plus this. Now, as you refine delta t and delta x equal to 0, Certainly, these terms will drop to zero, but not this term. What happens to that term? Because both delta t and delta x go to zero, the ratio need not go to zero. It can have a finite value. Okay. So, and if it does have a finite value, a how do you find such a limit? Laplace's rule, right? So, it's using that kind of an idea, you can find out what that limit is as delta t and delta x go to zero, if they are independent functions. But in this case, we control both. Uh, but if you take both of them to zero at the same rate, then the ratio would in fact be one, right? And so that term doesn't go to zero. And that term then survives as beta times UTT. So you are actually solving this differential equation if you are using the different factor method. So it's an example of an inconsistent approximation in the sense, we are thinking when you are solving this, we are solving the diffusion equation, but we are actually solving this. So this is a consistent appro approximation for this differential equation, right? But it is not a consistent approximation for what we thought we were solving, which is the diffusion equation. So stability analysis, okay? And with that, I think we will uh, wrap up the 1D PDEs, and maybe we'll talk about a little bit about the two-dimensional two extensions. So we talked about the concept of a stability, which is, it says that if the original system is bounded, the numerical approximation should also produce a bounded response. Okay. So how do we test for that? There are a number of methods, and I'm going to talk about only uh, so-called von Neumann method of stability analysis for PDEs. So you start off with the given discretization. And uh, here D is alpha delta T over delta X squared. I'm going to define an error term epsilon, which is the difference between the numerical approximation you had that you see, 
which is given by this equation, and u, which is the analytical result if there is one from the differential equation. That is the error. Okay, so I'm interested in knowing whether the error will grow or decay as I march in time. Okay, so the error is also determined by the same equation, the same template. So wherever I have, because I can simply subtract u from this and relabel it as the error. Okay, so the error equation is also the same. Error propagation is also determined by the same equation that propagates the u. Okay. Now, there are a couple of ways from this point one can do. One is called the matrix method. The other one is called actually the error propagation where you do a simulation. You take, a, you take a line and you have these grid points. You set the error everywhere to be equal to zero except for the error at one point as equal to one. And then march in, in time okay, and see how the error spreads. The spreading of the error will be determined by the diffusion term, okay? And then you want to see whether it explodes or decays the error, okay? <coughs> but the one that's mo more popular is the so-called von Neumann method, where you say, if I have an error, if I can plot the error versus x, okay? And it is some sort of an arbitrary error at some time. That arbitrary error can be represented in terms of a Fourier series. You're all familiar with Fourier series representation, right? We've talked about it in the transport phenomena course too. So that, that simply says I'm taking sines and cosines to construct an arbitrary periodic function, okay? And uh, the solution then is represented by this. This is very similar to what we did in hydrodynamic stability, so-called normal mode analysis, where we take uh, a perturbation from around the steady state. This is what also we did for when, when developing uh, the algorithms for bifurcation methods, when you look at the stability, um, so essentially the growth factor, the e to the power at is your growth factor, okay? And e to the power i sigma mx is the sines and cosines. These are the normal modes. So for each value of sigma m, sigma m is the wavelength of your particular sign. Remember, e to the power i x is sine x plus i cos x. So this is a way of representing the sines and cosines in an exponential form. And so the error is written as a linear combination of all these modes of various frequencies, okay? And we, we take each one of those modes for each value of sigma m and calculate what A is. A is our eigenvalue, if you like, in our normal stability analysis. And if the real part of that A is negative, then we have a stable response for this numerical scheme, okay? The, so essentially, one Neumann analysis is the normal mode analysis <coughs> <coughs> applied on the numerical method instead of a physical system to determine the physical stability. We apply that on the numerical method to determine the numerical stability, okay? So any questions on this? Is this idea clear? I have an error that's arbitrary that is propagated by the error propagation equation which is derived from the template for the finite difference equation itself. And that error can be decomposed into its normal modes, infinite terms in the Fourier series. But I'm going to take one particular frequency or one particular wavelength, sigma m. So from the summation, I'm just taking one term. But I mean, that term, can I can change the number, sigma m to be one or two or three or whatever, okay? And then I take that expression for the error, the approximate one term uh, from the Fourier series and plug it into the error equation. Okay, so I take this and plug it into the error equation. When I do that, watch carefully what happens. Okay, on the left side I have E i n plus 1. n plus 1 is t plus delta t. Okay, in the time domain. n is in the time domain. So n is at t, n plus 1 is t at delta, uh, t plus delta t. So I'm going to write this as E exponential of a multiplied by t plus delta t because it is n plus 1, okay? And then I have, of course, e to the power i sigma x. That is the error. The error has both components in time and in space, okay? But both in time and space, they are evaluated at different <coughs> locations. So if you look at the right side, it is d times 
error at i minus 1 n. Okay. So because it is at n, it's going to be e to the power a t. But because it is i minus 1, it's going to be e to the power i sigma m multiplied by x minus delta x. Okay. And uh, then this is the reference point itself, e to the power a t, e to the power i sigma x. And this is at i plus 1. So this is e to the power a t, e to the power i sigma m x plus delta x. So do you see this correspondence? So this is i x plus delta x because it is i plus 1. This is x minus delta x because it is i minus 1. Okay? And on the left hand side it is t plus delta t here because it is at n plus 1. Okay, now cancel out the common factors e to the power so that is, you split this into two parts, e to the power a t, e to the power a delta t. Okay, so you can cancel out e to the power a t, e to the power i sigma x for all the terms. And what you will be left with will be e to the power a delta t is equal to, that is from the left side, okay, that is the, that's the only term that survives, uh, equal to d times e to the power minus i sigma delta x. Okay, that's the only term that will survive here. And this term will simply become 1 minus 2d because we are canceling this term everywhere. e to the power 18 e to the power i sigma x. It's common for every term. And then you'll get e to the power plus i sigma m delta x. I guess I should just sigma m there. <coughs> so this is what the amplification factor is. With every delta t, if a is negative, then you have a stable system. If A is positive, then you have an unstable system. Okay? So, and we, we recall two more uh, trigonometric expressions, e to the power i x plus e to the power minus i x over 2 is cos x, and then sine uh, sin squared x over 2 is 1 minus uh, cos x, uh, 1 half. So using these trig identities, you can simplify that equation. <coughs> and this is your amplification factor. <coughs> Why is it the amplification factor? Because e to the power i, I mean e epsilon i n plus 1 is e to the power a t plus delta t, e to the power i sigma m x. But you can split that as e to the power a t multiplied by e to the power a delta t, e to the power i sigma x. But e to the power a t times e to the power i sigma x is the error at the nth step. Okay, so these two terms are the error at the nth step. So the error at the nth step is related to the error at the n plus one step. Let me just erase this so you see that relation to okay. The error at the nth step is related to the error at the n plus one step by this factor. And that's why we call that as the growth factor. So if that factor is less than 1, the error keeps decreasing. If that factor is greater than 1, the error keeps increasing. And in this particular case, we know what that factor is. So we need to ask the question, under what conditions is that term always less than 1? Okay. Of course, sine squared is going to be what? It's always between. Sine is between minus 1 and plus 1, no matter what choice you make for delta x, and no, more, no matter what sigma m is whichever wavelength you are considering, right? So sine squared is going to be between 0 and 1, always, okay? So the only way that you can make this greater than 1 if you make d to be a very large value, okay? So if d is less than 1 half, <coughs> then the growth factor will be less than 1. So that method will be stable. So that forward time central space difference is conditionally stable. It, the condition is that d must be less than 1 half, and d is nothing but uh, alpha delta t over delta x squared. Alpha is your diffusivity in the model. That comes from the model equation. So your, there is a constraint on your delta t and delta x. You cannot pick them to be anything that you want if you are using them forward time central space. You need to meet this criteria. Okay? Question? Well, if, suppose, just do thought experiment. D is 1. What will, the, what will that number amount to? If, if sine squared is 1 or less, if it's, let's say it's max value 1, 
the maximum value, that's what you have to find out, okay? Give the benefit of doubt and say sine square is the maximum possible yes. value. Can never, it'll be? Yeah, uh, sine square would be one. One. So set that value to be one and forget about sine square. Then you have one minus four D. Yeah, so if D is one, then you're going to have minus three. Right. Right, that's a growing number. If D is half, you're going to get one minus two. Right, so it'll be minus one. Okay. That will be the absolute boundary. If D is less than that, it's going to be less than 1. Absolute magnitude. You want the growth to be, uh, growth factor, absolute value of the growth factor to be less than 1. So maybe do, do this experiment. Uh, yes. I, I, I was beginning to do that. Since, you know, so it's a negative, negative uh, value. value. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Negative negative value. yeah. yeah. So negative uh, 1.01 .01 is not good because it's going to blow up. So you want negative 0.99, that will be fine. Right? And that will happen only when you have D as less than one half. <coughs> yeah, it's difficult for me also. Now you have inequalities that you need to solve. <laughs> right? <coughs> so the inequality that you really need to solve is set this as less than one and then solve for D. And this kind of a growth factor is developed for every one of the methods that we have seen, and more in Hoffman. But that's the basic idea of one-time instability analysis. You have an error equation, you decompose the error into Fourier modes, take one arbitrary mode, and develop what the growth factor is, and the, uh, whether the growth factor is larger or smaller than one. For implicit methods, you will find that there is no stability limit. You can pick delta t, delta x arbitrarily. So you're guided only by truncation error considerations. But for explicit methods, there is always a stability bound. It may not be half. It may be one-fourth. It may be whatever the number is. Uh, but you need to uh, make sure that you uh, abide by that so that your method doesn't blow up. But often, your truncation error requirements will be much smaller than that. <coughs> okay. So that's a kind of a quick survey of finite difference methods for 1D partial differential equation in one spatial dimensions. Uh, these days with ComSol, going from 1D to 2D is selecting the right button, <laughs> right? So it's, you really don't think about any, any, any more than that. Uh, of course, you need to build your 3D geometry. So your effort goes in there. But how, does, how do these ideas translate from 1D to 2D? And uh, what is the amount of work that needs to be done? And can this be automated? They've obviously been successfully automated in all these packages. So if I have a 2D heat equation, du dd equals alpha d squared u dx squared plus d squared u dy squared. So this would be a rod like this. So I have x uh, and y. And then I will have the time axis going there. So I need to find the solution in the xy plane for every time. Okay, and that is governed by an equation like this. And of course, you can imagine the 3D. Okay, so you'll have a, uh, a, a 3D spatial derivative, Laplacian in the in three, three coordinate direction, x, y, and z. Okay, so it's only the bookkeeping that gets more complicated. So in the 60s and 70s, if you solve an equation like this, probably it was equal to a PhD work. But not nowadays, it's an assignment in ComSol. <laughs> <coughs> in fact, if you've seen, uh, when I teach the mass transfer course, I use the book by Trebel, and there's one example of uh, transient uh, mass transfer uh, from a slab. And that was the thesis work in the 1950s, I think, um, solving the entire partial differential equation, of course, interpreting the results and getting the mass transfer coefficient out of it. But these days, it's an assignment in the mass transfer course, the very first assignment that you can do. So what is the idea here? Okay, so we're going to take a reference point in the method of lines. It's exactly the same. Okay? I'm discretizing only the space. So I'm replacing x and y by xi and yj, and I'm treating t as a continuous variable. Okay? So I'm going to reduce this partial differential equation into a large system of ordinary differential equations in time by discretizing the spatial derivatives that you see here. In the x direction, only the index i will change, i minus i plus 1, i, i minus 1. Then in the y direction, 
you will have only J changing. So that is approximated by the central difference approximation in the uh, y direction. And the time remains as, as such. Okay, so you, you, your, your objective is to get all these functions that you can program and then pass it to ODE45. So my domain, again, has to be a very regular domain. Okay, so this is x, and that is y, the way to define of reforms like this, uniform. Okay, this is i, that is j. i goes from 0 to n plus 1. j goes from 0 to m plus 1. Okay, and I'm considering Dirichlet boundary condition. So all the boundaries on this domain will be given as a number. Okay, so all the interior nodes are going to appear in, uh, as an unknown here for which I have an ordinary differential equation that I need to integrate in time. So I will end up with a total of n times m equations, ordinary differential equations. So the size of the problem goes up tremendously when you go from one space dimension to two space dimension to three space dimensions. But the ideas essentially remain the same. The bookkeeping task becomes very tedious. What is a bookkeeping task? For example, how do you impose the boundary condition at <coughs> x equal to 0 for all y? boundary. Suppose I give you a function, and the, the fun function there is uh, u at x equal to 0 as a function of y is equal to sine y, something like this, a known function. So every time I pick a grid point that is next to it, I will have a grid point on the boundary. So I need to pull that number from that function that is given to me. Okay. So the bookkeeping task is quite uh, tedious. But all the ideas for the methods carry forward from 1D to 2D. If you have an explicit method, then I'm replacing the time derivative by a forward difference approximation. It is a forward difference approximation because my reference point is uijn. Okay? And now I have just a set of algebraic, explicit algebraic equations. So it's one of the easiest ways to solve. So just take this to the right hand side. And you give me the values in the base plane at t equal to 0. Okay, that is, at all these points, at t equal to 0, you give me the value. I just sweep one direction at a time. Okay? I can go to the next level, n plus 1, use that, and uh, build, continue to build the solution. So it's a fairly straightforward extension for explicit method. What happens with implicit method? Same idea. Now I have to evaluate the right-hand side at n plus 1. What does that do? I don't know any of them, right? So I need to assemble all the unknowns at the level n plus 1 into a matrix form. Okay? So every time step, I need to invert a n by m ma uh, size matrix. Okay? That, that are, that. So if n is 20 and m is 20, I have 400 unknown. So I have a 400 by 400 matrix that I need to invert. Okay? So the computational challenge becomes more for the computer, the processor. Our challenge becomes more in terms of assembling the matrix if you're doing it, uh, writing it yourself. Question? Yeah, I mean, it's not nice and try to hang But as a graduate student, I've done all these things. <laughs> it is fun. You learn a lot by doing this. <coughs> these days you don't and that's one of my concerns in teaching a course like this is there's no point in reinventing these things I clearly see the benefit I mean if you are a chemist and you go to the lab and you use GC you don't really need to know how to put the GC together you need to know how it works so that you can use it intelligently the same argument can be made if you have Comsol and does all these things for you you should be able to use it intelligently you don't need to reinvent all these things okay that's argument on one side, but on the other side, I have felt, and my colleagues have said, it's always a good idea to write your first finite element solvent by yourself. <laughs> okay? It will take, take you six months to do that for at least for two-dimensional geometry, 
but then you really understand what comes on pass. Until you do that, you don't really understand what comes on pass or an answers does. Okay. So <coughs> I don't know where the that's a pedagogical issue. Where, where does one draw the line? And maybe open form is a nice neat intermediate because it's not a closed box. Answers and comes out of closed boxes. Um, open form, you actually have the code you can see and can put it together. So maybe there is some merit in using that in the classrooms. Next time I teach this course, I will do that. <laughs> All right. So I think that's essentially what I wanted to do for the finite difference method. We have still a few minutes, so I don't want to let you go. <laughs> I have an empty page here. The other way put it. <laughs> OK. <coughs> Question, yeah. We have discussed so many discretization schemes in time and space. Like, how do I know which one is best suited for my problem, say, for a given problem a priori? Is there any guideline? Like, uh, means I know the order of accuracy, and, uh, but how, like, some are more efficient if I use lower order, but still I could get away with it. Yeah, we, we talked about uh, this issue of uh, upwinding, for example. You definitely pick a lower order method just to suppress some spurious oscillations that occur in a second order central difference approximation for the convective term, right? So you learn only from experience. And typically, uh, second order scheme is considered to be a reasonable, good compromise. But it doesn't work always. If you take that and apply it to a hyperbolic equation, we saw methods that totally fail, unconditionally unstable, and stuff like that. So this kind of a testing is always needed whenever you are coming up with a new stencil or a new template for a finite difference approximation. You cannot know beforehand that it is going to work. Okay? Uh, but from experience, you can always rely. That is, if you're an engineer, you're solving a problem that must be solved, then you'll say, OK, I look at the literature, what has worked, and I'm going to use that. Okay. But if you are a numerical analyst trying to push the boundaries and say, I want to develop the next generation of algorithms. Okay. And there are a lot of papers, I think, uh, that came out in the 70s and 80s, actually. So where they don't use this finite difference uh, approximation. They will say, here is a differential operator. I'm going to approximate by a difference operator. I'm going to treat all the coefficients as unknowns. So why do I use, for example, this pattern in a central difference in two, two spatial dimensions? Central difference will give you this pattern with that as ij as the reference point. Central difference in x and central difference in y. Okay, so this would be an approximation for del square u term. If that appears in your differential equation, you can take the del square u term and approximate by the five point stencil. Okay, and people have argued why? Why should I do that? Because I'm limited only to <coughs> delta x squared term. Why can't I take a stencil like this? A nine point stencil. So the, uh, the approximation is actually approximated as a linear combination of all these coefficients i plus r minus 1, j plus r minus 1. I take all the neighboring points and I can try to construct the approximation like this. Now, that gives you extra degree of freedom because instead of finding five coefficients, you find nine coefficients. And instead of saying that I'm going to replace this by a finite different stencil, I'm going to say, I will let these coefficients be unknowns. I will find out the best value for these coefficients. How do I do that? I'll do Taylor series expansion. And I'll try to match with as many terms as possible. Right? <coughs> so with only five coefficients, I can match only up to delta x squared. Now that I have more, I, have, I can match it to delta x to the power 4. There are algorithms like that okay, for replacing a Laplacian with a more dense uh, template. Now what does that do to your matrix? <coughs> there will be more non-zero terms yeah. in your matrix. Okay, so the matrix becomes denser in some sense. <coughs> but finite difference methods often yield the most uh, sparse systems because they involve only the neighboring points. <coughs> the collocation methods and the method of weighted residual, there are two approaches. One is to say I'm going to do a global function, function that spans the entire space. Then you'll always get a dense matrix. And then the finite element method, which says, I'm going to use a local support, okay, that I'm just going to use a polynomial that is living only within an element, quadratic or a cubic polynomial. Then again, you are 
decoupling. Grid points that are far away do not influence that. So you end up with a sparse matrix also. <coughs> now I guess we are almost out of time. I'm glad that you asked the question. I was going to set up the basis for uh, orthogonal function, just like we saw orthogonal vectors, because we need that to build approximate representations of the solutions. So maybe we'll do that uh, next week. So the next two lectures, we'll spend as much as we can on uh, method of weighted residuals and uh, methods derived from that. And then the last two lectures, a little bit about finite kind of element method, which is kind of an extension, I think. All you're doing is re reducing the support to the local level. And it gives you extremely uh, flexible way of dealing with non-uniform uh, uh, geometries. Okay, so we'll stop there today. <coughs>